Counterfeits are not a new problem. They have been condemned by almost every government in the world, and there are a number of international accords to protect the intellectual property internationally. Despite this, counterfeit products have been gaining more attention in the recent years. The negative impact on consumers, industries, workers, and wholesalers and retailers are profound and significant. So counterfeit creates serious problems for authentic businesses. But too many people are unaware of the full extent of the impact of counterfeit goods on brands. Some of the key impacts of counterfeiting on brands is the loss of revenue, the damage that is caused to the brand image and the reputation, leaving companies to deal with fallouts of counterfeits and harming the long-term trust which is built between the customers and the stakeholders. Good morning, afternoon or evening to all the participants wherever you are in the world. My name is Hazem Ibrahim. Uh, the founder and CEO for Asia Security Group, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar, sponsored by Delarue. Fighting the fakes has become an essential mission for many brands, but the question remains on how. Today, our expert speakers will be sharing their views step by step on the effective strategies to protect your products from counterfeits in a 360 degree approach, covering intellectual property rights, effective public private, private partnerships, collaboration and global awareness, and the latest effective brand protection technologies to secure your products in the market. Our speakers for today do not need an introduction due to their highly active role in the fight against counterfeits. Therefore, my introduction uh, shall be brief. Uh, first, I'll introduce uh, Brett Bal Singh, who is the Senior Director at uh, Shah Egan. He specialized in intellectual property law for, with more than 34 years of legal practice experience. He's a prominent expert in Singapore trademark law and highly renowned and respected figure at the bar. Brit Bell has served on a several IB committees, including the Enforcement Committee of the International Trademark Association, the Anti-Counterfeiting Committee of the International Trademark Association, and the Law Society IB Committee. He is also an active member of the Asian Patent Attorneys Association. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Brit. Uh, next, I'll be introducing Ramesh Raj, who is currently the Pharmaceutical Security Institute Regional Director uh, for the Asia-Pacific region, where he carries out capacity building uh, and training for law enforcement agencies in the region in areas of focus on pharmaceutical crime, while he's working towards building and improving government relations with the pharmaceutical industry. Thanks for joining us today, Ramesh. Uh, lastly, I'll be introducing Jerome Bishop, who is the Business Development Director for Brand Protection in Europe and Asia at Delarue. Uh, Jerome joined Delarue in 2016 as the Head of Product Marketing for Authentication and Traceability with a focus to develop a product roadmap for brand and government security solutions. He has been actively participating to develop a digital tax stamp scheme for Delarue, and he was appointed in his current role earlier this year to boost brand protection sales. So uh, thanks all the speakers for joining us today. Uh, I think we can, uh, before it's going deep into the webinar topics, we can go through the agenda. So today we have three main topics which will be present presented by our speakers today. Topic one will be on IB rights, trademark registration, IB infringements, and brand protection, which will be presented by Barrett. Uh Second topic will be a guide to combating pharmaceutical crime, which will be presented by Ramesh. And the third topic will be on how current global pandemic has a significant effect on the use of e-commerce and implanted counterfeits, resulting in an increase of illicit trade presented by Giro. So I think, Fred, uh, you can have the stage. Thank you, Hazem. And um, I wish everybody a good day. Um, now, my perspective to today's talk is going to be from the legal side. For us to have an effective brand protection strategy from the legal perspective, we need to look at two issues. First, securing your IP rights by registering them wherever necessary. And secondly would be to enforce those IP rights effectively to protect your brands. So that's the view that I'm gonna be taking and then it's going to be as Azim said, there's gonna be a 360 degree overview we are having. The other two speakers will be looking from different perspectives. Mine will be limited to the legal perspective. Now, with that background, let us first give you an overview of your IP rights that are available in Singapore and how you need to secure them 
In other words, register them if necessary so that you can do the enforcement. So the first slide here gives you an overview of the statutory rights that are available in Singapore. We have the Trademarks Act, Patents Act, Copyright Act, and Registered Designs Act in Singapore. All of these collectively give you the IP rights that you would need to enforce in Singapore. What I'm gonna do for those who are uninitiated is to sort of give you a roadmap or a drawer how all of these IP rights come together um, to give you an armory. So what trademarks do, what patents do, what copyrights do, and what registered designs do. Then I'm gonna focus more on the trademarks because this is actually the strongest uh, IP right which many of the brand owners use to protect or enforce their brands in Singapore. So what do they do? And I'm gonna use the iPhone just as an example. So we've got a typical product here, which is a phone. A trademark would protect the brand of the phone. So if this is, I'm sure you can recognize it, this is Apple's iPhone. The trademark would be Apple iPhone, that protects the brand. So the, the, what is the trademark is basically an indicia of source. When someone mentions Apple, you know where this phone comes from. When someone mentions Samsung, you know where the phone comes from, who is the owner of the IP right. Hence, trademarks go for the brand to protect the name and reputation of the brand. Patents protect the invention behind the product. So if you bring yourself back in time, for example, to the days of Sir Alexander Graham Bell, when he first discovered that you can have a receiver and a transmitter and a copper wire in between, and hey, I talk on one side and you can hear me on the other side, that was actually one of the world's first patents. So the invention behind the product is what you would protect by patenting. The thing about patents is you have to register your patent straight away, otherwise you would lose novelty. If you use it first, the element of novelty is exposed and you can't register your patent. For trademarks, you could conceivably use it because we have common law rights in Singapore, but it's advisable to get it registered. So I'm gonna come back again to how to register the trademarks. But for the moment, again, an overview. Trademarks protect the brand. Patents the invention behind the brand. Copyright protects the written expression of an idea, not the idea itself. So for example, if I come up with a tune to a song, I have the lyrical copyright, I compose a uh, you know, the, sorry, the words would give me the lyrical copyright, the tune would give me a musical copyright. I come up with a drawing, that's the artistic copyright. So the idea is not protected, but the manner of expression of the idea would be protected under copyright. And in relation to say the phone again, in the old days, we would have a manual accompanying the product. That written manual would enjoy copyright, Nowadays, it's all in soft copy, but nonetheless, that enjoys copyright as well. For copyright in Singapore, it is automatic. As long as you comply with certain connecting factors, you have automatic protection. Some of these connecting factors are, for example, you are a Singapore citizen. You have created the work yourself. You did not slavishly copy the work from somebody else and it fits within the parameters of the Copyright Act, which is it's either a literary work, a musical work, an artistic work, or cinematographic work. If you fit within those parameters and you have created the work yourself, that work would be automatically protected in Singapore. You don't need to register it. Unlike some of the countries, for example, I understand in US, I'm not a US lawyer, but from some experience, they have a registry where you can register your copyright in, Singapore, in, in US. In Singapore, we don't yet have that. There's been some talk of getting a registry where you can register your copyright, but at the moment it's not. So the picture for copyrights is it's automatic 
And by virtue of the Bern Convention, Singapore is a member of the Bern Convention, we have reciprocal rights in other countries which are members of the Bern, for instance, US. Registered designs protect the shape of the product. So if I had a very distinctive shape, and some of you may recall back in the 90s, Nokia had come up with a sort of a banana phone. So if I come up with a very distinctive shape that conceivably could be registered as a design, if there is no similar design at the moment, and mine is novel again, it's something new, um, that design, that shape could be registered. So again, you could come up with a shape of a chair or something, which is new and novel, and you could get that registered. So in Singapore, these are the four statutory IP rights that we have. I want to focus primarily on trademarks because this is what IP owners typically use to protect their rights in Singapore and elsewhere. So, Hazim, the next slide, if you may. Hazim, the next slide. To register a trademark, essentially, I just want to give you guys some indicators. The registry would look at the distinctiveness of a mark versus the descriptiveness. What I mean to say here is the more distinctive a trademark, it would be registered. If it is descriptive, it would not be registered. So again, to give you the example of the Apple. If I want to register Apple for a phone, it is distinctive because the word Apple has nothing to do with a mobile device or phone. But if I want to register Apple for a food shop, it would be considered descriptive because I would be selling apples. Everybody else would want to sell apples. Why should I have monopoly over the word apple in relation to these products? This is the concept of distinctiveness versus descriptiveness. So when you apply to register a word mark or a logo as a trademark, you want to choose a mark that is distinctive. The highest level of this are coined marks. So by way of example, if you go back, many of you would have remembered the days of Kodak. Kodak was a coined word. So if you come up with a word which has never existed before, distinctive, you would have no problem. Descriptive, example of one of the marks which I've had to register, houseman canteen. A house, houseman, as all of you know, is a junior trainee doctor. Canteen is basically a place where you go to eat. So we wanted to register this trademark, but we knew we were going to have descriptiveness objections. The thing that helped us was this mark had been used in Singapore by the General Hospital to describe its canteen for 40 over years. They had immense usage. So what we did, we got objections that it could not be registered, it's descriptive. We put in statutory evidence of usage to show that this mark has acquired distinctiveness. We showed statistics of how many people are in and out of the hospital every day and they come into contact with the Houseman Canteen. Everybody knows the Houseman Canteen. It has become distinctive of the applicant. And our arguments were accepted. The mark was subsequently registered. So I hope to have given you a feel of when you choose to register a trademark, on the one hand, the strongest one is something that is distinctive, a coined mark. On the other hand, you may have a relatively or totally descriptive mark, but you know, if you have used it and you have acquired factual distinctiveness of an immense value, you could still perhaps get it through. Depends on how we argue the case. So let's assume now we managed to register the trademark. 
oh, sorry, the next element for you to consider when you register a trademark is classification. You need to make sure you register it in the right classes. So example, if you are selling clothing, you would go into class 25, which typically covers footwear, clothing, and headgear. But you want to make sure that you also cover other related classes. For example, a class 25 gives you the ability to put your trademark on the product and to stop people from doing the same. But consider the retail aspect of it. Now, retail is a service that will be classified under class 35. So you should consider also registering your trademark in class 35 so that you cover both sides of the equation. The product is protected under 25. The service sector is protected under 35. So two things in my mind which you need to consider seriously. The mark itself, am I going to get it through? Distinctive, descriptive. Three, I need to make sure I got the correct classes. Um, and that, that would be a good start to getting your registration. Now, a mark is in Singapore is valid for a period of 10 years. After 10 years, you have to renew the trademark. If you don't renew it, it's going to lapse. That could cause you a lot of problems. Somebody else might go get it registered. You would have immense problems trying to set things right. So monitor the renewal dates and keep it active. So that's an introduction on the registration. That's procuring your trademark rights. Now I'm going to look at the second issue, which is taking these trademark rights which are registered and enforcing them. That's the next slide, Pazim. So in Singapore, a trademark owner, IP owner, would have conceivably two causes of action open to him. If there is an infringer out there who is copying the mark, the IP owner can either take out a civil action or a criminal action. Civil action is essentially taking out a writ of summons. You send a letter of demand to stop the guy. He doesn't stop. You then take out a writ of summons with the usual remedies. You're applying for an injunction, uh, damages, and costs. The other available remedy in Singapore, which I personally feel is very effective, is a criminal action. In Singapore, under the Trademarks Act, what we, a trademark owner can do is apply to the Attorney General's Chambers for a fiat, which is permission to prosecute. So this is typically done in the following scenario. Let's say I've got some evidence that someone is selling counterfeit products. First thing I need to do is get evidence of that. So I would go do a test purchase. This would be the evidence that I need. With the test purchase, I apply to the subordinate courts of Singapore for a search warrant. I would need to satisfy the judge that this person is selling the counterfeit goods, hence this is the trap purchase. And if the judge is satisfied that there is a case made out, he issues a search warrant. We would then work with the police who would execute the search warrant. The police would go down to the premises, execute the search warrant and seize all the infringing quality, quantities that we have. Now why I find this particularly attractive is I get all of the goods by way of the seizure as opposed to the civil action where I send a letter of demand. Conceivably, I would have also done one trap purchase. I've got evidence of his wrongdoing. But when I send the letter of demand, it is conceivable that he would reply to say, oh, you know what, I only sold a few items. I did not sell so many. And so the damages which I'm going to recover are going to be limited. Whereas with the criminal action, you know what, I have seized his stuff he's going to have a hard time explaining the quantities that he has been selling. And 
all of this is now on the criminal side the subject of a fine as well i still have my civil action open to me later if i want to take that up but i still more importantly can take him to court and get him fined on the criminal action and that is quite a deterrent in singapore people are afraid of having a criminal conviction so i personally have found that when brands take the criminal criminal route word gets around and infringers say you know what these guys are going to come after me i'd rather not infringe this fellow's ip rights let me pick someone who's not taking his brand seriously so that's in a nutshell the remedies available now just a bit more on it on how we also collaborate with customs and the police so i mentioned to you that in the criminal action i have a private prosecution here now let me also explain to you how the big picture works with the police on their own and customs so what we typically do is we would send a letter there, there is no record in, in, in system in Singapore of someone's IP rights. Other countries, I understand, have this record system where you can record your rights. In Singapore, there is no official record system. So what we typically do is we will have a letter sent to the IPRB, which is the Intellectual Property Rights Branch of the CID, which is the Criminal Investigation Department. In Singapore, we are pretty famous for acronymizing everything. Everything's an acronym. So bear with me. It's, we have the IPRB. We send a letter to IPRB telling them we act for so and so. These are the IP owners of this trademark. We send a similar letter to customs. So that notifies both departments of the IPR owners' rights. What happens then is the IPRB would be on the lookout. They do their own investigations and they are very active department in Singapore. When they come across, let's say a big infringer who is having a whole lot of products that he's selling and they notify that one of those brands happens to be the one that they have received notification of from me, they would contact us and they would say, hey, we have received um, you know, our investigations have found that this guy is selling. Um, can you verify that the goods are counterfeit? We would then go down, take pictures, in, you know, evaluate the situation, examine the goods. And then we would have to put up a technical report on behalf of the client. This technical report is used by the police when they prosecute this guy. So this is a police action on its own. It is not the private action which I described earlier where I apply for a search warrant. That would be like a collaborative action. I'm heading it, but the police do the search for me. Here, this is an entirely police action. Our role is only limited to identifying the goods and confirming that they are counterfeit. So the police sees the goods, they get the confirmation from us that they are counterfeits, and everything is handled by the police. So the IPR owner does not have to pay for the costs here. The costs that they pay are limited to the work that we do in getting the technical report. Police will then take this guy to court, get a conviction. In most cases, frankly, the guy pleads guilty. He is sentenced and fined. Customs, how they operate is once you notify them that you have these IP rights, if they come across a shipment which is bearing products with your client's rights, they will notify us. We notify custom, us, the, the IPR owner, and then it's up to us whether we want to take action. The one difficulty with the customs is they have a very short window within which we have to go back. It's like 48 hours, we have to give them a deposit of $20,000. We have to pay their administrative fee, which is about 200 plus dollars. That's the one you know, downside. We have to move really fast. So usually what happens with the, our clients is they won't have set aside a deposit already. And the moment we receive something like this, it's just a matter of go ahead, use this, 
and go ahead with the system. So that is an overview of um, the, the, the customs and uh, IPRB. Um, is, is, is that the last slide, Azim? Yeah. So, and I think I'm almost up with my time here. So I will save um, the rest of the time if we've got any questions. And I pass over to you, Ramesh. Yep, so if anyone has a question, feel free to drop the, in the chat box the question, or you can unmute and ask directly to the speaker. Thanks, Fred. It was a walk down memory lane, actually, when you're talking about IPRB and the 48 hour window and how fast you need to seize the items. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's quite an experience. Just, you know, that's how we all got to know each other as well. Hi. Right. Um, okay. All right. Uh, very good evening to one and all. And a big thanks to Hazim uh, Asia Security Group for inviting me and the rest of the speakers as well to this webinar uh, and to discuss the many real challenges that we now faced and which will possibly become the, the things that we need to normalize with as the new norm, right? Um, it's a Friday after all, so kick back, you know, grab that cold beverage wherever you are and hope to soak, that you soak up for the next 45 minutes or so, you know, whatever that we have to offer, okay? Yeah, it's a Friday, so, you know, people need to just relax and unwind a little bit. All right, uh, as economies around the world are suffering from the impact of COVID-19, Businesses are experiencing losses, workers are without jobs, and many face the challenge of a complete upheaval of lifestyle. Uh, Prit, you know, if you've done a very good job in providing a very comprehensive understanding on the legal parameters surrounding fighting the fakes. Uh, and I hope that, you know, uh, for the next few slides, I can bring about some clarity um, about fighting the fakes on the daily basis, um, on the daily basis, right? And, but before that, it's, here's a quick introduction about PSI and about the work that we do. Uh, Hazim, if you could, uh, can you just go on to the uh, second slide? Yes, that's right. All right, just very quickly, uh, the Pharmaceutical Security Institute, PSI, is actually a non-for-profit organization uh, with three main fundamental pillars, which is actually protecting the public. And how do we go about doing this? It's about sharing information on counterfeiting of pharmaceuticals and who do we share this with? With law enforcement and by way of initiating operations. Um, let me just expand a little bit more on that. The next slide, please. All right, so we have currently about 37 of the world's biggest pharmaceutical manufacturers as our members who go on about every day, um, you know, carrying out operations with the respective law enforcement agencies all over the world. And based on that, on whatever information and intelligence that we get, we gather that, we collate that, and together with our, both our international law enforcement partners and regional law enforcement partners, um, we put up a very comprehensive intelligence report, which we share to them. And hopefully with that, they can go on to actually, you know, carry out very successful operations and, and cripple these syndicates who are actually doing a lot of injustice by introducing counterfeits to us, All right? So that's, uh, that's the general scheme of things. Okay, next one. Uh, so regardless on the product in question, the fight against fake starts from the very beginning. There are experts among us, and I've already seen some product packaging experts. Thomas, welcome to this as well. There are product packaging experts and other experts here as well, carry on investigation. So, you know, what I'm about to talk is about based on my experience and what I've gathered in the last almost 30 years. And but clearly that may or may not differ from your very own experiences, but I'm more than happy to learn as well from you guys. Um, but if I were to tackle each and every one of component here, um, it will, this is like a two or three day uh, entire full day presentations. But of course I'm not going to, you know, in the interest of time, I'm going to provide you brief synopsis here. And if you have any burning questions, just put it up in the chat or you know, feel free to ask us live as well. But save it towards the end once uh, Jerome has finished his presentation. All right, so when you're talking about FTA approval and the manufacturers, often criminal syndicates manufacturing counterfeit medicines carry out uh, preparations in very unsanitized warehouses. Actual facilities are actually FDA approved and all aligned with the respective countries' drug laws. Uh, the biggest concern here in this aspect of it is when the facility is actually broken into, the products are stolen, 
and you know such uh, such issues are actually very common in some parts of the world. Stolen products are either illegally diverted or from then on counterfeited and then moved on and replicated and sold off to everyone else. So hence company have to ensure that they carry out very strict risk assessment on the building, the security measures, the way the Q&A, the, the QA is being done till, yeah, till the time it leaves this manufacturers, right? So we're talking about the supply chain. This is where the bulk of it lies in. The coronavirus has put you know, supply chains around the world under pressure. Um, even with uh, airports closed and suppliers are struggling, clients like look, clients and consumers like you and me still expect goods to be delivered. And while supply chain leaders are very busy securing their networks, an additional challenge has actually grown in the dark. Counter of leverage, an ever-present feeling of fear and uncertainty to flood the market with counterfeit products and misinformation. Their goal is just this, take advantage of the demand and panic buying. This is very evident. If you were to just Google into Europol or Interpol's website, you will see the huge amount of seizures that they have done in the last few months. I know that Europol carried out a very successful operation seizing more than 30 over 1,000 counterfeit masks, right? Even though I represent the pharmaceutical industry, it is just it is very dangerous to assume that only healthcare products and related consumers are actually impacted by fakes and or counterfeiting as the result of COVID-19. The pandemic of causing people to shop online more often, which means you buy almost everything online. This is a very big shift from our traditional retail uh, therapy uh, to an increased reliance on online shopping. Supply chains must now adopt a new process in their planning and responses to alert of fakes and counterfeit products. Immediate decisive action across the supply chain coupled with alongside uh, strategic elimination and prediction measures will determine a long-standing repetition of your business as well as, well as a broader market, uh, as well as a broader market, peer and brand image. There are actually three main components, which I'll just talk very briefly about here, um, you know, that organizations can implement if they want to do so. It is actually communicate, monitor, collaborate. So when, you, when I'm saying communicate, you know, this, might sound, it, this might sound too easy to be too, but in, in actual fact, transparency of communication is really one of the most effective ways to counter counterfeits, especially in the digital space. Organizations can point out uh, to their customers towards reliable sources and educate them into how to recognize trustworthy products and sites. You know, um, yesterday we were talking about, you know, yesterday in, a, in another webinar, we were talking about the, uh, the issues on, on, on the cyberware and how criminals are taking advantage of that. That is another consideration. But again, there is an entirely different component on cybersecurity here, which I will not dwell on. <clears throat> Monitor. If you were to sell a product that is very likely to be counterfeit, it makes sense to create a multidisciplinary team that is continuously monitors and interprets threats posed by counterfeits. Uh, the team should include experts of brand and image protection, but also specialists from uh, hardcore, from core supply chain functions, as for procurements and leaders working across sustainability and traceability. Right. So again, in a nutshell, if you are hiring, looking at vendors who are providing you brand protection, security, and, and stuff like that, you have to ensure that these vendors know their business. Right. Uh, it's it's a very demanding business right now, and everybody is a very competitive and demanding business right now. All right. In terms of packaging, I will not elaborate too much, but I want to say this: depending on which website you actually visit. The global pharmaceutical packaging market uh, was initially estimated to be about $77 billion industry, but that was in 2016. In the next few years, this is expected to be in the range of about $150 billion or more. Our quality and risk management specialists can contribute to valuable insights as well. Such a counterfeit task force is well equipped to take more significant counterfeit activities to work on bringing in to attention on platform providers and authorities. 
Um, I know this as well, first time information because we have been collaborating and working with uh, marketplace operators, social media operators as well, you know, trying to get their buy-in and to let them understand as well how big and dynamic the problem is and how collaboration together is the right way forward. Um, again, so that brings me to collaboration, but this topic actually, you know, dwells a little bit more on the private, public-private partnership. So I'll just merge that in the interest of time. Are we on good time, uh, Hazim? Okay, great. So public-private partnership. Public-private partnership or the three Ps, right, uh, is being utilized in almost every industry sector across the globe. Uh, but nowhere are the, is the PPP more critical, as critical in the global fight to curb counterfeit medicines. This problem is so pervasive, so broad, and so global that we cannot even begin to address it without sincere collaboration amongst every stakeholder in all continents. Speaking of platform operators, it is it, in this time of increased online shopping, I know we are all are guilty of it, it's, it's crucial to forge close collaboration with key players in the marketplace to tackle the counterfeit challenge. Those ties can accelerate response time to events when and as they occur. Uh, like what Preet mentioned, you know, in Singapore, it's a very short window of 48 hours. Therefore, speedy report, reporting and removal of fake products and helping to prevent to consumer trust and your organization reputation is very fundamentally crucial and it's very, very basic. So these are the things that you actually need to look into as well. Equally important is the relationship um, to the relevant authorities and peers that might experience similar challenges. A good approach here is to collaborate via the industry associations. This is what PSI does, uh, to focus on the problems on counterfeiting um, and the collective actions that can take across all product types. Uh, associations can also help stream authority relationships, collect best practices. And um, yeah, again, as I mentioned, this is one of PSI's core functions as well. You know, when we were in pre-COVID times, uh, one of the main things that we did was to build relationship with governments, build relationship with um, the law enforcement agencies, from the police to the customs, to the drug regulators. It's about bringing them up to speed on the global problem on counterfeit drugs. If I had not mentioned to them, or if, if nobody goes ahead and mentions to them, very few of us who are even listening now would even understand that every year, there are more than 300,000 children who actually die because of counterfeit medicines. There will be some point in time where we find a vaccine for COVID. COVID becomes yesterday's news, but the number of children dying from counterfeit medicine will keep on growing. Vietnam's National Assembly recently codified the provisions of public-private partnership. Uh, which will probably take effect uh, 1st January 2021. Um, you know, the new law introduces, uh, reduces, sorry, the new law reduces the uncertainties of other laws uh, that may apply. And what does this actually does for a country like Vietnam? It actually undoubtedly attracts more private and foreign investment. If only if more countries are as forward thinking as Vietnam in this aspect, we would, you know, move obviously change to a global mindset, change our global mindset. PSI takes every effort and what we can to, to speak, to advocate on public-private partnership, you know, just on this, uh, during this COVID period as well, we have done so many relationship efforts to build relationships. But what, you, what we have noticed and what my other colleagues from other industry have also noticed is this, it is easier working with developing countries as opposed to a lot more developed countries. Um, for, for very obvious reasons, I think the developing countries need more help and, and this is where we want to come in. We want to partner them and we want to bring them up to speed as well. But I think developed countries, even like Singapore as well, should always remember this, that the issues surrounding counterfeits or fighting the face. It's not a one country problem, one nation problem, or one industry problem. 
it is a global problem and it does require a global collective approach. So that's, that's my take on, on the entire issues uh, with respect to you know, supply chain, on protecting your mind. But again, like I mentioned, this is a very short synopsis given the time that we can talk about. There are other aspects that you need to look into, you know, your own cybersecurity, like I mentioned, from the very basics of maintaining the risk in your building to your QA on how the medicines are being manufactured and how the supply chain comes in. There are a lot of introduction on blockchain technology. You need to understand how blockchain technology can help you because if you don't understand that, that's when the problem comes in. Um, you need to understand the end-to-end -end serialization in, in EU. This is, it, it's a law, it's, it's, it's widely applicable, it's done that way. But can it be, I've asked, been asked questions, why not, you know, in ASEAN we adopt something like that. You must understand that, that the big bulk of ASEAN are in many different stages of, of development. Um, therefore, it would not, it, we cannot go ahead and say that I want to invent a law, I want to come up or implement a law where everybody has to follow because not every country would have similar uh, features of uh, similar technology set in place to carry this out as well. So we have to weigh in terms, but we have to, first of all, we have to understand how big the problem is, appreciate, collaborate, and only then we are in the right direction of moving this forward. So yes, that is my take and I shall now leave it to uh, Jerome. So feel free to ask questions if there is any. Thank you. I think you have received a couple of questions on the chat. If you can, if you can access the chat actually, Jerome. Ramesh, can you, can you hear me? Yes, it was quite uh, soft, all right. Uh, do you want to take the questions now? Or Jerome, why don't you just start first while I just look at the questions? Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> As you prefer, Ramesh, thank you. You, you will need to share your screen, correct? Yeah, uh, if I can, yeah, that would be uh, uh, useful. Thank you. Tell me when you can access it and see it. I can now see your screen. That's okay. Well, thank you, uh, Pri. Thank you, Azem, for the hosting. Uh, thank you, Pri, for the uh, 360 uh, vision. Uh, we shared this view uh, yesterday. I think it's, uh, it's absolutely uh, great that you could share actually what the IP and, uh, and patent uh, infringement can do in terms of not only uh, securing brand value, but also having corrective action uh, when uh, brand protection or illicit trade is at stake. Uh, thank you again also, Ramesh. I will, uh, I will mention you in a uh, in couple of um, times in my presentation because uh, the vertical you've been addressing is one of the um, obviously critical uh, dealing with the health and safety and life of people. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not the only one uh, being, uh, being uh, the victim of, uh, of illicit trade. So what we will uh, do here is that we will share some views and, and uh, best practices as well of uh, what we've seen uh, during uh, many years in, uh, in the business. Uh, I've been in the packaging industry before as well, so I've been you know, a, a brand owner user. Uh, so uh, we will try to share with you this view of a, what do we do in terms of brand protection, not for the corrective action mentioned by principal, but more on the um, preventive action. What should be done to prevent any uh, brand protection uh, fraud or attack? And actually, uh, useless to mention that uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, still going on, right? Would have said that uh, in, in uh, February, March. I mean, uh, we would have uh, probably uh, all hope we would go back to normal nowadays, right, in September, October. Well, it's not the case. Uh, we're still uh, talking about lockdown. Some countries have, uh, have been actually locking their... Uh, there are shops, brick and mortar shops, traditional shops uh, recently, as uh, we heard in Israel, but also in many other different countries. So that's uh, still uh, a vivid and, and, and current issue. Uh, this has had uh, 
several collateral effects actually uh, for the business. Massive increase of the online e-commerce business, hence easier even for the uh, counterfeiter, you know, to uh, to try to uh, to fake uh, a product and also to uh, to uh, attend to the uh, value of the brand. So, what are we talking when we talk about counterfeiting? Well, it's it's a massive issue. Uh, we talk about, of course, cigarettes, but we talk also. You mentioned that Ramesh mask. You know, during the COVID nineteen, we had face fake mask coming from. Uh, from China, but not only from China, from uh, different countries as well. Um, every single product which is manufactured, so that's might be one also uh, difference with the uh, IPM patent. We are here protecting the physical goods which have uh, industries, facilities where they are manufactured and sold to a different marketplace. Uh, every single product then I was saying, uh, which, is, uh, which is physically produced, can be a counterfeit. It's not a question of value anymore. <laughs> Before you could say, well, I'm, I'm selling a very high hand uh, whiskey or, uh, or, uh, or a luxury bag, it is subject to counterfeit. Well, not anymore. You know, uh, the face marks, what is the price per, uh, per unit? Less than $1, a uh, couple of cents per, per mask, and those have been uh, counterfeited. So, what we were mentioning is on top of that, now we can see fake websites rising up uh, using the uh, traditional eBay, uh, Amazon, I mean the uh, e-commerce uh, marketplaces and trying to um, uh, uh, propose uh, the uh, different channels which are even uh, fake channels. So how do you navigate into this uh, very uh, global issue we are, we are facing. And we were mentioning a figure, 1.2 trillion, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's the equivalent of Indonesia GDP, just as a, as a measure of, uh, so it's, it's, it's phenomenal, the, uh, the amount of, uh, of issues uh, for the uh, counterfeiting. So when we talk to, uh, to a brand owner, uh, and this is, this is again our experience. Uh, what do they want? First of all, they want uh, security. Uh, they want security, they want authentic, authenticity of their product. They want uh, their product to be seen as genuine or they want the product to be sold at the right place. This has been mentioned also in one of the uh, uh, chat question to avoid gray market. So good product, but sold at the wrong place. They want to, to, to trust also, to, to create trust. Why? Because the, the, the trusted brand, uh, they are creating values based on, on, on this uh, trust from the consumer. If the trust is not anymore there, then the value is going down and the revenue is, get, is, getting, uh, is getting away. And finally, uh, not always, uh, for instance, in pharma, that's not one of the main uh, topic, but in luxury goods, for instance, it has also to be supporting the brand identity and enhancing the product. So in some cases, it has to be invisible. Some cases, it has to be completed, embed, completely, completely sorry, embedded into the brand identity of the product. So as, as a brand owner, who do I talk to? The IP, the legal, pre, or do I talk to my supply chain, manufacturing uh, site manager? Do I talk to my sales ma marketing director to make sure that uh, what he wants is uh, avoiding gray market and, 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 and uh, identifying the uh, proper selective networks. So that's question number one. Question number two is what? What do I want? Because there is a jungle of solution on the marketplace. Uh, I, I saw a question on, on the holography. Uh, we will uh, talk about that in, in the presentation later on. Uh, but it's, it's amazing the number of medium when I say medium, I'm, 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 I'm nice. Very small companies offering a brand protection solution. And those brand protection solution being uh, supplied locally, okay, you have a value for what you pay for. Uh, but, but then it's, it's really a question. What do you want to implement? And how in terms of, uh, of uh, scalability? Do you want a, a local regional program? Or do you, have to, or do you want to have your... Um, a, uh, homogeneity uh, when you're selling your product in Western European country, in US, in Dubai, uh, in, uh, in Asia, in uh, Malaysia, wherever, 
you want to have the same product. Uh, just just, uh, just uh, coming back to uh, just for a minute as, a, as an experience, personal experience, you, 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 I went to a Lamborghini uh, store, not to buy a Lamborghini, unfortunately, uh, but uh, visiting the, the shore be, be, because I was you know, fascinated by this car. But I went to uh, there in, in Shanghai. And, and what I had to look at the car was a photocopy of the brochure of the, of, the, of the product. So you can imagine that the value of the car was absolutely not reflected in the corporate uh, a presentation I received from the, uh, from the seller. So this is very important. How do we, uh, how do, how do this uh, actually uh, uh, COVID-19, but also the impact that have had on the, on the business are also changing the uh, approach of the of the uh, of the companies. So we said it. Uh, COVID nineteen accelerated the e-commerce. Um, uh, I spoke with a cosmetic uh, company here in the UK uh, a couple of months back. They told me uh, they want two three years digitization in two three months lockdown. Uh, they move from almost nil to sixty percent of their revenue sold online all of a sudden. So, uh, uh, and, and actually uh, the, uh, the uh, Bureau, uh, US Bureau report a, shown a, a massive exponential growth in the US. Uh, in June, for instance, the uh, e-commerce almost doubled, plus 80%. So, um, so this has been also emboldening the uh, counterfeiters uh, and, and, and they've been taking advantage also of this, uh, let's say, let's say unprepared brands uh, being visible now through different uh, uh, selling networks. On top of that, and you, you mentioned it, Ramesh, uh, pharma regulation. It's not the only verticals, but that's the one which has been predominantly imposing a path in a direction to better traceability, better tr control of the product, to, trying to basically uh, avoid what you, what you've been describing as as hurting the uh, the, the 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 public, right, and and also uh, causing uh, uh, death uh, damage in in the worst case scenario. CSR going in the same direction. <clears throat> now you you have the um, a need for more clarity, more transparency. That's a, that's a very uh, uh, very elegant word, which is basically saying I want to know. The, 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 where, wherever I'm buying from, if the product I'm buying from is, is, is authentic, coming from where it was supposed to be, uh, to be coming from. So the origin of goods is also now very much uh, related to the, uh, to the uh, uh, carbon control, uh, 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 neutral and, uh, and control mostly. So rethinking your customer experience uh, buying online product has to be one key priority for the brands nowadays. And, and, and keeping the trust, as we said uh, before, um, uh, including, you know, following up uh, with uh, loyalty program, marketing engagement, once the product is delivered to the, to the uh, consumer. So you're sitting like I'm sitting today, and most of you probably are uh, hearing this, uh, this chat uh, in, in this uh, Friday morning in the UK. Uh, you, uh, you're sitting at home and you're buying from home. So uh, when you receive your product, uh, and that's, that's an interesting actually uh, McKinsey, uh, which was published this year in April uh, 2020, uh, uh, there is a, an interesting survey which is giving uh, showing that the, the, the customer, uh, they want to go and buy trusted brand. Trusted brand may mean I want to be sure that what I'm buying is, is, is genuine. So uh, when you're unboxing uh, the product, when you receive your goods at home, and, and that's actually uh, linked to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the packaging question in the, in, the, in the chat, how can I trust it? The secondary packaging, I'm not talking even about, about the industrial packaging, which is even recovering the, uh, the secondary one, is a part of the product, part of the product identity. So if you want to have a brand protection program, you have to, have to ask yourself, do I want to only protect the, um, the item? Do I want to protect the secondary packaging? Do I want to protect the cases? And share that immediately with the consumer when they receive the goods. So by 
unboxing a product, you can obviously scan it and go to internet to have a, to have a, a validation, but what about a validation linking you to a fake website? What about a QR code which would have been copied? Well, this is why we uh, believe uh, at Dollar Read that uh, you need an instant verification which is provided by physical security measure. And by the way, the physical, the touch and feel experience. So now we don't touch anymore even our grandma uh, because of this, of this pandemic. And that's, that's, a, that's a worry for all of us. And we, we have to be cautious. But what we can see, and we've seen that, we have experienced that already in the uh, uh, brick and mortar, in the, in the traditional shops, we've seen the differences already. They put some measures in place. So I'm talking or asking to the brand, what do you do for your business to protect your business when it is by, bought online rather than by, by, bought as it was used to be for decades, if not century, in the case of luxury goods, through uh, traditional shops. So it's very important to consider how uh, this role can be accomplished with uh, uh, authentication, how to verify and how a brand uh, can give the trust and give the confidence, uh, the security to a customer that the product is buying uh, uh, is, is genuine. So yeah, we, you, can, you can hear that this music, uh, everything goes digital, so it has to be a, a brand protection, uh, only a digital measure. Okay, that's, that's one music you can hear. Uh, I, I don't believe in it. Uh, the the, um, the uh, only reason for that, it is um, when you don't have any uh, a v instant verification, which is uh, uh, with naked eye completely uh, um, enabling the uh, consumer to, uh, to be uh, tested and verified, it is allowing the lazy counterfeiter to, uh, to break into your uh, business. Uh, so, we do recommend indeed some um, holography to ensure uh, that the end user has this instant verification without, without using any device. And on top of that, he can obviously use some e-verification. And why I'm mentioning that? Well, okay, we always consider that the world now is, is, is a big village, right? Uh, we, uh, we always consider that we all have the same means in terms of connectivity. Well, that's not true. Only 57 of the population, so 7.7 uh, 7, 7 billion, close to 8 billion, uh, I'm sure, of the population, so 57% is connected only. So what do you do in the uh, room, remote areas where you don't have any connectivity? If your internet is, is, is breaking up, if the speed, uh, you see 50 times faster in Singapore compared to Algiers, North Africa, uh, that's, that's, that's big difference. So what the rest of the world, which is not connected, should do if you only enable a e-verification with, uh, with connectivity. And, and just as a reminder, we all have, because uh, it's, it's, it's uh, imposed by, by, by law, an, an ID document when we are traveling. And, and there, there are more and more now, and, and actually Singapore was one of the, more, uh, one of the first country on, on the earth to have an e-passport, what we call e-passport. So with the e-passport, it's very, con con it's very uh, convenient. You go through a gate when it exists, and you get your passport being uh, read automatically. Well, first of all, the gates are not everywhere widespread, as you know and sometimes they are not simply working. So having uh, worked at Dollaru in the uh, banknotes industry and the uh, supply of security ID uh, features, we know by experience by sharing with the uh, custom officers, you mentioned them in, in your, uh, in your um, uh, pitch, uh, Ramesh, but also the, uh, the uh, controller at the border, that they have only 20, 30 seconds to check a passport genuine or fake. So what they are they looking at, and this is ECL uh, mentioning it into his uh, recommendation, they look at the holographic of the, of the passport. So you see, basics uh, are uh, still predominantly used even in the highly security um, uh, document, like uh, passport, ID document, and bank notes that I didn't mention.
So you can imagine that what a, a, a hologram can do for an ID document, it can, it can obviously do it for your brand. So you, again, I'm not saying this is the only solution, but it has to be part of your investigation and what you plan uh, to be um, your uh, brand protection uh, program being efficient, being uh, strong enough to resist the counterfeiters. So along, um, even if you know holography has been here for, for a long time and you can, you can also find it uh, uh, in, in different places, uh, it is not only now uh, um, an element of uh, brand protection, but it's also enhancing the product. So you can completely embed, and we've been working very recently with uh, electronic brands to give them not only um, authenticity, uh, but also uh, fitting completely with their uh, brand corporate identity. So that's something um, uh, that can be done also and achieved by, by holography. So just, just uh, a bit of uh, info, we have uh, two different holography technology uh, at Dollarue. One which is a uh, uh, embossed holography we are using mostly for uh, ID document, uh, currency, but also you can imagine what we can do for your, for your brands. Uh, very secure level, um, um, so overt features, so visible with naked eyes, but also covered with a very basic device like a, for instance, a, a UV lamp. You can, you can detect a, a security features which is hidden. Or if you want to go further down, forensic. Uh, so uh, uh, you go in the lab, you have something which is uh, um, only uh, 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 revealed uh, with spe spe special uh, means, such as, for instance, chemical components. Uh, Lipman holography, that's an interesting also uh, uh, holography, uh, hologram type of. It's a multi-layer polymer, so it's a very unique technology you cannot find on the marketplace very easily. Actually, there are only two manufacturers in the world capable to do this. One is in the Japan, <laughs> and, the, and the other one is us based in, uh, in, the, uh, in the US, in Utah states. So uh, very amazing uh, three-dimensional aspects and very also visual, uh, instant, uh, easy uh, verification with a dot uh, which are uh, reflected uh, when you are tilting the label. So physical versus digital. For us, clearly it has to be a combined approach. And, and depending on your, uh, on your uh, uh, problematic, depending on the issues you, you're facing, you can use uh, fully uh, uh, or 80% digital and then going on to the uh, physical aspect of the security features as well. So uh, the uh, smartphone engagement is a complement of an efficient uh, uh, physical security features you are using and we are still using in the most secure document in the world. That's why I, I was insisting. So and engaging, uh, attracting visually the, the, the product, having the possibility to immediately uh, detect what is uh, fake from genuine is important. Enhancing, we said it, brands that don't want to, uh, to spoil the, the, the quality of their uh, product and or packaging. So it has to be softly embedded into the brand identity, but it has to be a, enabling the law enforcement officer mentioned by Pre to go on the field, to lock down the, uh, the counterfeiters when the product is not uh, revealed as, as being genuine. So what do we do uh, in terms of uh, combination? Well, what do we recommend actually? We recommend to use these security features, which is physical, as we said, with um, a QR code. And I've heard about the uh, question about the QR code. So uh, normally, you, 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 when you interact with a brand, you do this uh, serialization, uh, you do this uh, management of the uh, security label together with the manufacturing site. That's the heart of the activity. And we will see that later when we will share a slide on the, on the marketplace online, because if you don't act where the product is originated, 
it's 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 tough because you can you can allow uh, a gray market or even you know fake product to uh, to to join you know even uh, uh, official uh, networks. So the, what what is the QR code giving you? The QR code is giving you an identity, but this identity is not a security. is a not is a um, a way to give the historical figures, the traceability of your product along the supply chain. And, and um, in, in brand protection, you can go with a basic, I am manufacturing in point A and I'm selling in point Z, and I just want to uh, secure the point A and be in a position to do a e verification on the point Z. But then you won't have the, 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 the historical figures along the supply chain. Uh, if you want to have this, uh, this uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, definition of the link, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, enabling a product to, uh, to flow through a supply chain, this is much more critical. This implement a hardware uh, solution to be implemented and, uh, and carry out at the manufacturing side, but also the distributors and, and warehousing um, uh, as well. So, in summary, if you want to have the whole picture of your supply chain, it's always a challenge as you're selling to many different countries. So, um, uh, I don't have, a, 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 let's say, a unique answer for that. It will always depend on how much money you want to invest in your program. And, and what kind of efficiency you want to, uh, to, to achieve. But I would say if you start already by identifying, associating your product with uh, one security uh, features, which is, uh, which is a marker, which is a label, and then at the end of the supply chain, enabling your law enforcement officers and or your consumer to uh, distinguish what is uh, genuine from fake, what is what has to be sold in this territory and what has not to be there, this is already a massive step forward, okay? So um, um, this slide is, is just giving you the perspective of uh, and the differences between authentication and traceability. Again, authentication, what is genuine, what is fake? Um, remember, passport. The passport is giving you the, an identity, but a fake passport is giving you an identity which is fake. So it has to be authentic. It has to be genuine. And then the trustability discussion we just had now, what do you want to measure? What do you want to control? Uh, well, this is, the, this is the critical question and the, there is no single answer. So then here we inviting you obviously to discuss uh, in, in, in private discussion, in one-to-one -one discussion, to engage what could be the, the, the ideal solution for you. Um, we are dealing uh, at Dollarue with uh, multi um, uh, billions of product for tax time, okay? Tax time scheme. When, when a country decides, for instance, to um, uh, apply taxes on, it's namely most of the time, tobacco, but it could be wine and spirit or whatever the product is, they decide to control everything flowing in their territory. So what do we do at Dollarue? We are dealing with all the manufacturers of this industry, wherever they are located, and we declare to the government what has been uh, identified as uh, a label, in this case a stamp, for each product. And we report that to the government. Well, this is exactly what we do for Microsoft also for more than 21 years. We are monitoring uh, every single EOM which are authorized uh, um, uh, user of a Microsoft Office and, uh, and then we are declaring that back to Microsoft. So, you know, again, it depends very much on what is the size of your problem and what uh, measures you want to, um, to, uh, to put in place. So just a, a bit of a of a sales pitch here. Sorry for that. Um, this is the this is the overall product uh, portfolio. You know, it starts with multi-layer approach. So we start with a physical token, and and uh, I'm you know I'm I'm happy to share with you some views about uh, 
is it still valid or not to use uh, to use holography? I've seen this question in the chat uh, before. We do believe it is. And, and then you apply the uh, digital platform, the multi-suite, which is enabling you to give the traceability of the, of the, of the product. But again, to get to the uh, final stage, which is a full track and trace, uh, well, let's talk together because it's, it's a long, long way. So what we do uh, recommend um, having the control of how many products are uh, manufactured. That can allow you ver a very simple um, problem, over overrun, over production. You know that some counterfeiters, um, I, won't, I won't mention any, any country, but, but some countries uh, were used to be uh, manufacturing overrun of good, good products. So how, as a brand, do you control them? Well, if they have not received 100 security label, they can't, cannot produce 110. Or they will have to do also a fake uh, security label. You see what I mean? So this is where the, uh, uh, the control starts at the production. And then you can enable your Salesforce uh, law enforcement officers with a simple mobile app or even you know, your consumer, your end consumers, you can give, give them access to scan the QR code, to land on a page where they will absolutely be instructed. Uh, and this is actually what uh, Microsoft is doing for decades, you know, uh, on their how to tell website. Uh, they will be instructed how to read, how to uh, verify a, a, a product. And, and this is, this is uh, working very well. Uh, last but not least, uh, we, we talk a lot about online e-commerce being um, uh, drastically increasing. Well, how, how do you cope with this, this issue? How do you control it? Well, bear in mind always, the discussion needs to start with the brand. The brand owner needs to take the decision to uh, properly put a, a program, a brand protection, as I said before, as a preventive action, if you want to be in a position to control whatever the sales channels will be in the future, including those uh, uh, online uh, marketplace uh, platform. By enabling uh, the control of the uh, production with a security um, uh, holographic label, the primary uh, objective is ensuring a safe online marketplace um, uh, distribution. And, and you can even, you know, have your, uh, if you see my mouse, uh, a report of traceability or certificate of, of authenticity being issued. And uh, at, the, at the consumer, unboxing the product, you remember the photo we've seen before, when you receive the good at home, you are in a position yourself to control if the uh, good is, is genuine or fake. So that's, in, in, in a nutshell, really, uh, I don't know if I, oh, I'm, I'm on time. Azim, sorry if I've been a little bit long. That's okay. So that's, in a nutshell, what uh, we would like and what we wanted to share with you as, as an experience. Um, it's very important as a brand that you ask yourself if the uh, solution provider you talk to is enabled to go with you in terms of scalability is is enabling you to uh, implement multi-program uh, approaches and why i'm saying that is because a uh, very uh, one of the largest cosmetic companies when you talk to them and uh, we, you talk about uh, one specific program they will tell you you know what i've got 14 different factories all over the globe which are doing this product but i want when this product is coming out of the factory I want exactly the same touch and feel from every uh, single location. And this is why, you know, talking to a um, to, um, 200 years old uh, company with over uh, 2,500 2, uh, employees worldwide, but still with a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, dynamic and, and new technology mindset uh, is, is very key. So, so, well, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope it has been a, a matter of interest for you. And, uh, well, any query, let us know. 
Thank you, Jerome. I think we have a few questions in the chat box, if you can access the chat box. I can. Let me, I should stop sharing, I guess, to access it. Yes, now I can access it. So, um, you want to read them for me, uh, Azim? Maybe you, you've seen them before. So, uh, I've seen one from uh, Dipin. I hope I could give some ideas of what we think. And, uh, you know, Dipin uh, Kotari, thank you for raising your point. Uh, what do you think, guys, about security hologram labels in the packaging for pharma industry? I hope we gave some, uh, some info about, about this, uh, Dipin. You, you might have some uh, more uh, questions. We, we do not say this is the uh, unique solution, but we do mention this is still valuable option uh, and very easy for the consumer, for the uh, reseller in the case of the, uh, of the pharma industry, for instance, for the, uh, when you are selling your, your, your medicine on, on the counter to immediately check. And uh, it is um, a, uh, was the, one of the most physical security features used in, 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 the, in the most severe governmental uh, document worldwide. So uh, ID document, as we, as we said, and, uh, and banknotes. Um, I think you have a question on Liban holography as well from Dibin. He's asking what's new in that Lipman holography. If you could please give more information about it, it would be very helpful. Okay, okay. Well, very good. Happy to, uh, to have a, a chat with, uh, with him directly. So the Lipman technology you know, in opposition to the embossed holography. Uh, embossed holography is a, is a, is a traditional uh, holography. We started at Dollarie in, in 1990, right, to develop it. And then we've been uh, constantly, permanently uh, improving the technology. Lipman, different. Uh, we are using a single sourcing of uh, polymer, uh, which, is, uh, which is one very important IP for us, uh, Pre, uh, We are securing it. And, uh, and, and the, the sourcing of the material, start to be the key of the of the of this uh, of this hologram of this ISON because uh, as I said before only two manufacturers in the world so when you start with a secure supply chain or sourcing then uh, part of the uh, of the success is guaranteed as well but the effect is amazing uh, this is something you uh, in terms of uh, parallax in, and in terms of three-dimensional uh, perception it's it's quite amazing. So I'm, I'm I'm I would be happy to send you some samples if you want to drop me your uh, your email address in uh, in in the box I, as a private message. We will carry on. Hi, Dipin. Yeah, hi. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> hi. Uh, so uh, can I can I uh, Hazim? Can I talk? Yep. Is that, yeah. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Jerome, for uh, introducing me to Lipman and you know a few other holography. Uh, techniques. Uh, I also had one question. This is a lot of my customers. They ask me, uh, how do you identify a hologram? Because <laughs> everything looks alike but for a customer. Uh, the difference, the customer will not know what, what a hologram is like the difference between the security features inside the hologram for them. It will just look one color. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's always, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, so you need, you need education. You need right. to communicate proactively to the, the, the people that has to authentify it, uh, has to verify it, uh, what they have to look at and specifically. So you can come with overt, so very visible with naked eyes, uh, security uh, effects, which are <coughs> unique and very, very difficult to replicate. You know, people are often saying, well, yeah, but you know, holography, you can, you can find it in the, in the garage over there. It's, it's not like that. You know? when, and this is why it's still working for banknotes and for uh, ID documents. Because if I, if I return you the question, what would you uh, check uh, if, it is, if it were not hologram? For instance, if, how do you check a QR code? A QR code can be copied. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, 
the, the, this is one of the uh, 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 rare measure, rare physical security features that can be uh, with naked eyes, but also with a, a very simple device. For instance, you can use a length, uh, you know, uh, increasing the size of a, of a, of a, of a nano uh, uh, micro text yeah, and, yeah. And, and reveal it. But this information will be hidden from the common public unless you want to give them the, and share the information. So uh, I, I, I strongly advocate you actually to, uh, to go on. Uh, I can share some uh, different websites where some of our brand customers are proactively communicating with their end users. Uh, I would love to. I will, I will share that with you. Uh, yeah. Microsoft is a good example. Brother is another good example where they are uh, bringing their, their end user, the consumer, uh, to actually uh, see how they can check, verify the product online uh, with their uh, uh, naked eyes or, or a very uh, basic uh, uh, device, which is uh, a lens or something like that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah, feel free to unmute and ask the speaker directly if you have any question that you would like to ask the speaker. All right. Um, can I speak, please? Yep, yep, feel free. Okay. Uh, first, thank you for, uh, for this uh, meeting. Uh, but, uh, not really a question per se, but just uh, sort of a suggestion. Uh, is there a way that uh, uh, we could have uh, more of education in the developing countries like you mentioned. For instance, for those of us in Africa, we have a lot of challenges with issues of authentication and all the rest. Can we take these trainings directly to government agencies uh, uh, who are supposed to understand what they're supposed to do? Is there anything that Dilaru can do in that regard, especially with that training can be domesticated to, to be peculiar to each country or for each society so that when they have a basic understanding of what is missing, then it will be easy for them to also understand what they ought to do. Is that well, clear? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, where, are you, where are you calling from, actually, uh, Emmanuel? I, I'm calling from Nigeria. Nigeria, right. Yes. We have a very large factory in Kenya, as you're probably okay. aware of, if not. Well, yes, yes, yes. So, yes. so we are at the La Rue, present in uh, 20 dif 25 different countries, actually. Uh, yeah. Very uh, large hub in Dubai, uh, people in the Middle East as well, but also in, uh, in, the, in several uh, African countries. It's absolutely okay. uh, spot on what you said. It has to yeah. be... So it is the decision of the, of the brand. You remember yeah. what we discussed, right? In terms of what is the size of the program? Do, do I want a program which is regional, local? Okay. Yeah. Or, or do, you, do I want to implement it um, broadly, internationally, uh, in 2,500 different countries? That's question okay. number one. And then okay. we are uh, more than happy to engage with our uh, local resource or uh, directly with any uh, uh, local authorities to, um, again, share best, practice, be best practices. This is, okay. you know, uh, a never ending battle against counterfeiters. Okay. Yeah. So uh, very happy to, uh, to take your point uh, offline and, and, and carry on and, and following up with you, uh, Emmanuel. I will appreciate that. Merci. Thank you for your, for your Thank question. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May, may I just add on to what Jerome has just said for your benefit, Emmanuel. Many brands in Singapore, after they have decided that this is a market which is of importance to them, they, like I said, the first step to an enforcement is you must have your IP rights registered. If you don't have these registrations in place, you can't take legal enforcement action. So yeah. assuming that the brands are registered, what the brand owners have done, many of them, is they've actually come to Singapore and conducted training sessions with the customs and with the police. Okay. 
And the customs and police are very happy to, to, to meet up with people. They provide the facilities um, and the trade, the IPR owners then bring originals, counterfeits, for examples, and they tell them how to distinguish. If they come okay. across products which they are not sure whether this is an original or a fake, this is how, and they share some of the ins and outs, how to tell the product from, you know, the original from a fake. And okay. the hologram, just to add on again to what Jerome said, that's an excellent tool which we have found in our law enforcement. Because okay. they, they, you know, once they, they, they know that this is one way of looking for the counterfeit and to identify it with the presence of the hologram, it works. Yeah. So we in court actually have used the hologram very effectively to show this guy is dealing with counterfeits and this is our okay. proof. Okay. So it's, it is, um, you know, it's just an add on to what Jerome has just said, which I totally yeah. agree with. Yeah, I agree too. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Pray. Yeah. yeah. I think you have one more question from Mark. Uh, do you have any information on copyright use of yeah. emblems and coats of arms that are sometimes incorporated within security documents and product pro brand protection uh, devices? So, uh, Mark, forgive me if I'm not sh really addressing the question. Uh, please feel free to, to redirect my, my answer. But um, just by way of a general background, first off, under our Trademarks Act in Singapore, emblems and coats of arms are specifically protected, whereby a third party cannot take another country's coat of arms or emblems and apply for protect protection. That, that is the domain of that country. So no one would have the right to exclusively, you know, say that, oh, I am using this. It, it belongs actually to the coat of arms or the emblem of that particular country. That's specifically provided for under the trademarks regime. Copyright, a different act, basically gives you the, you know, the, the, the right to say that this is my work and I want to get protection for this design. Now, again, trying to put both IP rights together, I can't claim any proprietary rights to the coat of arms which belong to a country. Mm. Yeah, so that's... it would not fall within the domain of the copyright. Mm. And within the domain of the trademarks, the Act recognizes that this is actually, the, so to speak, the, the, the property or the domain of that country which owns the coat of arms or emblems. So I'm not sure whether I've addressed your question. Please feel free to, to, to correct me on, on, online here. No, that's, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks, um, Prithi Pal. I think you've answered what I, what I was trying to get to really is who owns these? Because um, it's a question that I got fielded a few times um, for the International Hologram Manufacturers Association, where you get a member organization hmm. who um, has made a hologram using a coat of arms from, from, the from a state enterprise. The hologram manufacturer then switches to another supplier and there's then this debate on who owns the copyright and the trademark and uh, the coat of arms and all these kind of things that, that you know, regularly come up yeah. and very often it ends up getting a lawyer involved. So yeah, you, yeah. you provided so, some good, good information there, thank you. Good, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, you're welcome. I think very, uh, one more question for you. Uh, it's not on, it was sent to me directly, so I'll just read it out to you. So for replicates of a product that uses a trademark that is slightly different. So for example, Adidas, they would use the same product replicated but change Adidas to Abibas, they would change the D to a B. So sorry, is, is this is this to me, Hazim? I can't hear you. you. Oh sorry. Okay. So for replicates of a product that use a trademark that is slightly different from the authentic trademark that the brand has registered, for example, uh, Adidas shoe. Mm -hmm. They would change the letters in Adidas to a B, so it becomes a Abibas. So, are there actions that the brand can take to bring down these products and uh, seize it, for example? Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, once someone registers a trademark, his rights to enforce, as you have pointed out, are for that trademark that he has represented. Now, someone uses 
a mark which has been modified. The issue before the court is going to be whether he has taken the essential particulars of that trademark. And you need to look at the mark that is registered versus the mark that is not registered. You have to do a visual comparison. You have to do an oral comparison, the words pronounced, a conceptual comparison, see whether there is similarity and whether this similarity is likely to confuse the public. So these are the, the steps that the court is going to take to determine whether the marks as registered are being infringed by the other mark. So how much they have changed it is actually a question of fact, which I have to look at or the court would look at to determine whether there is this similarity which is likely to lead to confusion. So to give you an example, this is a court of appeal case which has set down the law in Singapore. They found that the mark St. Regis for hotels, and I'm sure you've heard of the St. Regis brand, it's a six-star hotel, they found that Park Regis would have been confusingly similar. So when Park Regis applied to register their trademark, it was rejected on the grounds that if this was applied for and allowed to be registered, it would be confusingly similar to St. Regis. So this is just to give you an idea of how the courts grapple with the issue. They had found that the, the dominant factor in the St. Regis mark was the word Regis. Saint was commonly used in the hotel industry. Similarly, Park Regis, Park is commonly used in the hotel industry. Regis is the dominant feature in the mark again. And for that basis, it was not allowed. So when you ask me to look at a mark and whether this is an infringement, it's going to be a question of examining both the marks, looking at them and seeing whether there's likely to be some element of confusion. Yep, so thank you. Gives you an idea because I, I can't make a decision. I have to look at the thing and, and decide it on the facts of each case. I think we, uh, Ramesh, I have, uh, there's a question for you as well on the private, which is uh, in terms of public private partnerships, who should initiate the collaboration or who should take the initiative to start the collaboration with the government or a technology partner? And should technologies be more involved with the brand and the government agency? I think uh, the short answer is um, in order to ensure success in this area, I think nobody to be shy about this. I think if the country uh, wants to engage and you know, wants to uh, activate uh, active engagement, I think they can reach out as well. And of course, if the industry realizes that this particular country or agency is impacted, they can go ahead and outreach to them. I think at the end of the day, the outcome will still be a win-win regardless who initiates the engagement. Uh, this would be my, my, my quick reply to that. Uh, what was the other one with respect to technology? Yeah, should the technology also be involved in the collaboration as, as the as a security solution provider? So be, them being part of the collaboration would connect the dots even further, make the brand be able to easily uh, inform if there is a counterfeit to straight away to the customs or the technology straight away to the customs. All right, so I think from this one and a half hour long webinar, um, it is quite clear to, 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 to craft or to start any engagement with willful blindness and avoiding technology would be a walk through doomsday. I think we should understand and we should accept that technology is an evolving part of the way moving forward. I think we should hear that it exists because that's the only way we can understand how it's applicable and therefore we will be able to understand its challenges both in terms of regulatory concept, the legal parameters, and the application as well. So I think it should be part of the formulation. Yep. Thank, thanks, Ramesh. I think, Jerome, one more question for you is, uh, how do you encourage consumers to actually scan a QR code or scan the authentication? So 
how what kind of incentives would you use to encourage consumers to do so yeah so um so the the today the um well first of all it's it's a question of generation right uh, uh i'm a bit older than you Azim. yeah mm, yeah i guess <laughs> so uh of course when i when i was uh, at school or university I didn't have even you know a, a a smartphone or mobile so uh scanning a code has not been something intuitive and natural for me now you, you you've seen two uh, two effects so first of all asia has been dri driving this very much and in particular uh, china as a country um, um, any kind of uh, uh, e-payment uh, being being implemented so scanning a code uh, on the shop to control the, the the good and to see and to uh, visit the website is something more and more natural for the uh, new generation. So that's point number one. But also, you, yes, you can incentivize your your consumer. And and uh, there is a very um, famous brand I will not mention here in the US, which is uh, actually uh, doing a loyalty program, uh, offering discount for uh, their consumer to uh, not force them, but to incentivize them to scan. And and be it or not, of course, the the, the the level, the percentage rate, still pretty low, and I won't mention uh, figures here, but it's it's not over uh, fifty percent. Let's put it in this way: it's it's much below than that. Nevertheless, when it is done by hundreds, by thousands, by millions, in the case of uh, very large uh, countries slash continent, this is an immense value for the brand. Uh, they can extrapolate based on uh, very uh, restricted numbers. They can extrapolate a lot of uh, information based on, uh, on international intelligence. So, uh, so this is to 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 answer to your point. This is already happening with the new generation. The the fact of scanning, and on top of that, if you have on your packaging, for instance, a scan, and you will get a ten percent discount on your new uh, purchase. That that will happen more and more, and 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 second is um, yeah the, um, the, uh, the the fact that the, the QR code now are more and more popular as well. Uh, before it was nobody had the uh, the uh, the ID even you know to, to scan it. So it's uh, it's coming into the uh, the habits, and then yes, it has to be also uh, motivated by the brand. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Rom. I think. Uh, we've covered all the questions. I think we have one more. All right, I think uh, we've covered all the questions. And we're actually almost out of time as well. So, uh, uh, well, usually in events, we, we would come around and take a group picture. But since that we are, <laughs> we're all at home, so maybe you could take a group screenshot or something. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that's a good idea. We'll do it and right all away. Uh, open our cameras, we can take a group screenshot, which would be also fun. Okay. Everyone is opening his cameras, that's quite cool. So This is to mark everyone's attendance. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thomas. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's good. Everyone. That's Hi, everyone. Yeah, that's really cool. Really cool to see, okay. the, to see you all of Hi, you Jerome. from all of different is... places. <laughs> okay. As an organizer, I really miss seeing people's face. I just don't want to see the name on the screen. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Okay. It was really very fantastic session. Thanks to Zerum. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Rama. Thank you. Okay, well, we just need you to open the camera and then we, uh, we, we can take a full screen picture because I still see names on my screen. <laughs> okay. And we, we smile, one, two, three, smile, cheese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just let me take one more. All right, one, two, three. Cheers. Oh. Cheers. Thank okay. you. <laughs> all right. Very good. Thank you for attending all, all of right. you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank stay you. safe. Stay Have safe. A good thank weekend, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you from here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ramesh. Hey. All right. Cheers. Tony. <laughs> <laughs>
All right.